This is Master Clockwork, Director of Operations for Everfree Northwest, and you are listening to the MBS Show. Hello and welcome to the MBS Show. My name is Daniel Anthony and I'm hosting this week. Joining me is the trusty usual host of the MBS Show, Norman Sanzo. Hello and welcome to episode 66. Hi Norman, how are you? Fine, thank you, fine, thank you. So, today we have a few awesome guests on our show. First of all, we would like to introduce them. They are part of the Everfree Northwest organizational team. We have Tim. Hello. Name's Bonnie Tim. Nice to meet you guys. Awesome, awesome. And uh, what do you do on the EFNW panel? Uh, I'm actually currently the director of media and PR for Everfree Northwest. All right, that's awesome. And I see you brought a friend. Yes, I did. Clockwork, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My uh, OC handle generally is Master Clockwork, just Clockwork for short, and I am the Director of Operations for Everfree Northwest. Great to have you two on. So, before we proceed with the show, we have to ask you four very, 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 very important questions. To start off, Tim, why don't you go first? Which is your favorite character? Uh, my favorite character would have to be the, uh, would have to be Pinkie Pie. I mean, come on, who does not love a party? And favorite episode would have to be Lesson Zero, uh, mostly because they opened it up with anyone could write a friendship report, which allowed uh, a lot more flexibility with the episodes. That's a good point. And of course, seeing that you're organizing one really, really, really big party coming up soon. Oh, I have a lot more respect for Pinkie Pie after uh, organizing this party. <laughs> okay, so Clockwork, how about you? Favorite character, I'm still torn between Twilight and Rainbow Dash. You got all multiple choices, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, don't ask me to pick between the two. It's just that I love, my love for them is, is kind of very equal. Favorite episode, you know, that still harkens back to season one with Cutie Mark Chronicles. Nothing quite goes above and beyond that for me. I have a lot of episodes I love, but that one has a special place in my heart. All right. So, Tim, coming back to you, how did you become a brony? Well, a uh, little bit of background. I really didn't know anything about the show. I remember the first time I ever even noticed it. I saw this uh, friend of mine. She was using a Cintiq, and you know, she was watching an episode off to the side. And uh, now she was drawing, and like, I poked a little fun at her. Be like, ponies, really? Um, how old are you? And uh, like, I had no idea anything that they'd even relaunch the show at this point. But in like a typical... Uh, 20-something uh, college guy who had no idea any, anything about ponies. Fast forward about a month later, I'm walking from uh, my door. I, I just finished my laundry, and I run into my one of my best friends at the college. Like, uh, him and me were very, very tight. And now we're talking as I'm going to my dorm, and as we get to his room, uh, my room's further down the hall, I'm like, so what are you going to do? And it's like, I'm going to watch him ever and for ponies. I'm like, what? Seriously? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you want to join me? I'm like, okay. I didn't feel like doing homework, and I wanted to hang out with my friend. I'm like, I can just uh, poke fun at this thing. Why not? <laughs> Three or four episodes later, I think the first one I saw, I can't confirm this. I don't remember which one I first saw, but I think I saw uh, Sonic Rain Boom first. And we just watch a bunch of episodes. And I go back to my dorm room, and I start from the beginning, and I watch a few more episodes. <laughs> By the end of the week, I'm through the entire first season, and I'm waiting for the second season. I'm like, oh, oh no, I'm hooked. <laughs> oh, no, I'm hooked. What, what is this? He started so to see a Sonic Rainbow. That means he had it. He, you know, he was on to you. Yeah, I was like, what is this? Uh, I was, honestly, I was uh, very surprised at how well put together the show was. Like, well, again, I mean, you go in, My Little Pony. It's prancing, frizzy ponies, right? <laughs> but no, uh, Actually, I have a little bit of a theory that uh, one reason the show did so well is because it challenged people's uh, perception. I like to call it the Susan Boyle effect. Uh, you go in with a preconceived notion, <laughs> it shatters that notion, and because it does that, it actually sticks with you that much stronger. Almost everyone I hear talk about My Little Pony, uh, they go in thinking, why would I even like this? That's not everyone's story, but a lot of people go in not thinking they're going to like it. And when they like it, I mean, it's a shock for them. So it's a stronger reaction for them. Definitely. So um, how do your friends and family react to you becoming a brony? Sometimes they poke a little bit of fun, but usually they're pretty cool with it. I'm not very in their face about it. I don't uh, proselytize the fact that I'm brony. Okay. Uh, so I have a little Pinkie Pie at my uh, cubicle at work. My team manager actually currently knows that I'm 
the director of media for the uh, for a <laughs> bro, like for a My Little Pony convention, not stuff like that. Which uh, actually, one of my friends, another team manager at my job, uh, is trying to be like, dude, you should totally hook me up with one of those uh, Brony girls. I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's a first. But no, I get, but no. Generally, I don't really go off my way to let people know that I'm a brony. I'm, I don't hide it, but I don't go out and rub it in people's faces, I guess you could say. So yeah, uh, I usually don't get a lot of flack about it. I guess it doesn't really usually come up in a lot of conversations. When I call my folks up, I don't really talk about My Little Pony. I live on like the other side of the continent, well, more like halfway across the continent from my family. So when I give them a call... Usually we, we talk about other things. So. <laughs> yes, definitely. So. But you're calling me halfway across the world and we're talking about ponies. Well, yes, but that's our common interest. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Ponies is what brought us together. Correct, that's after true. We have a common bond of pony. Yes, definitely. So, Coco, let's hear your story. How did you become a brony? Well, I belong to quite a few other fandoms prior to My Little Pony and tend to frequent quite a few different art galleries and art boards. That's kind of one of the things that I'm a big fan of is fan-generated work. And on one of the sites, or actually a couple of the sites, but one specific, I just suddenly saw a bunch of people drawing ponies, and I had no idea why. <laughs> I thought there was some new meme going on, because, hey, it's the internet. Why not? There was a several months I went through where everybody was drawing their character eating a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> But eventually, someone linked me to this video somebody made that was titled Rainbow Dash is God. Uh, and, it <laughs> was, and it was the scene from Ticketmaster where Rainbow Dash is up in the cloud, and the sun's behind her, it almost kind of looks like a halo, and she's talking to Twilight. And someone had dubbed in the audio from Monty Python and the Search for the Holy Grail. <laughs> And I'm here busting up laughing, and I'm like going, okay, okay, this is what the new My Little Pony is? Because I'd actually been aware of the show. I, I keep up with the cartoon scene. I just, it was My Little Pony. Why would I care? But I was like, okay, I'll give this a try. Why not? What What's the harm? So I get a hold of the first two episodes. By the way, right away, I'm a big cartoon fan. Right away, I recognize the art styling. And I'm like, wow, this looks a lot like Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so, yeah, I actually caught the Lower and Faust connection, like, right away. And I was like, it blew my mind. And I was like, just just knowing she was involved, I was like, this may be better than I thought it's going to be. <laughs> but, you know, I start sitting down and I watch the episodes. And I, I have to admit, the thing that blew my mind right away, the level of Flash animation already is just amazing for a TV show. You can't use new ground comparisons, just a different world. But the characters were so snarky to each other. I've never seen a kid's show where the characters were actually kind of a little, to not get feminist on my back, they were kind of bitchy towards each other. <laughs> and I kind of like that. That makes sense, you have a point there. Yeah, I mean, they, they were all, I mean, when the show started off, the, the characters were just becoming friends. They were a little snippy and snooty towards each other. They've Their dynamics changed over time. But yeah, no, it, I, I was just amazed. It just... Just not used to that for a kid's show. They're, all the girls are usually so happy and friendly and let's... Yeah. Uh, so it was or nice to Or says, you know, cardboard figures with permanent smiles. Right. Yeah. I.e. I monster. Hi. Uh, <laughs> but, you yeah, know, I start watching a few episodes and I'm like, uh, I'm okay with it. I'm not really hooked. And, you know, until we get to winter wrap up and then big musical score and I'm a big sucker for the old Disney movies and musicals and I was like I that I fell in love and went crazy and started turning all my old characters from different projects into ponies. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like one hell of a transformation right there. So how did your family and friends react to that? Well my family's pretty used to my eccentricities already from all the different stuff I do. I mean I've been going to conventions already for close to ten years it is for other Whoa. fandoms. Yeah. <laughs> So, this was just another thing to add to the weird pile to them. <laughs> but what's funny for my family is that I have a three-year-old nephew going on four here later this year. Okay. And he's fallen in love with the show. My dad tried to get him into uh, Transformers. He wasn't into it. He loves My Little Pony. 
And so my sister started watching it because, you know, she wants to know what her kid's watching. And my mom started watching with them when she babysits them. So my dad even went out and got him some My Little Pony toys. And so it's kind of grown on my family where it's just become kind of a, this normal thing. And uh, So it's like a big family deal now. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm the real big fan, but because of my nephew, it's really gone from my family kind of making me the butt of a few jokes to where it is actually become part of our household. Uh-huh. That's really cool. I wish I had a family like that. Well, it helps that most of my family, you know, I grew up in a household, I'm like, you know, second generation nerd. So I grew up in a household where watching cartoons was normal. So even my parents love cartoons. When I was a kid, my parents would get up every Saturday morning and watch trans, um, you know, G.I. Joe, Transformers, X-Men, Spider-Man. They'd watch all that stuff and they, they genuinely liked it. My mom, she actually absolutely loves the Phoenix Saga. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I mean, my dad is like a totally not a geek at all, but my mom is a total Trekkie. My uh, gosh, she has such a thing for John for John Luke Picard. <laughs> but and I mean, yeah, parents were even into just one band. <laughs> uh, but if you're gonna go with friends, uh, most of my friends uh, are were already into it, but. You know, it took us a while to admit it to each other. <laughs> so you were a late bloomer in a sense? Well, I got into it, I'd say I started watching the show, it was December Jan- December 2010, January 2011, and I didn't really consider myself a brony until probably the summer 2011, because I, it was a bit of a transition where I was like, oh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a fan of the show, I'm not really part of that community, they're a little bit weird, but the, the community grew on me and I started getting involved like my first big pony thing was um northwest brony fest and that's what kind of made me get involved with the community at large wow welcome to the new age then (laughs) (laughs) so now that we've done with our four main questions we've unlocked the rest of the podcast so we move on into a little bit of housekeeping and first of all our host norman sanzo recently recorded a special on Equestria Girls with a couple of well-known bronies. You can catch the discussion in the link below. Also, on Tuesday, Black Griffin came over to Malaysia with the U.S. Navy band and they performed and I went there to see him. And it was amazing, guys. It was an experience not to be missed. And I know a lot of people in the States also died to meet Black Griffin and I had a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Black Griffin, thank you so much for that one night. It was a great performance he put on all the, those bronies who were there, you know, you all turned up, you all showed great support for him. And one more thing is that Black Griffin is now the first person, the first MBS show award winner to collect his plot. And Norman, why don't you take the last one? Okay. Today at 1.30am North American time, the lovely Kiki Havi, a good friend of Terra Strong and bronies all around, passed away. We here at the MBS show would like to give our sincerest condolences. She has been an inspiring beacon of hope and goodness. Now, if you don't mind, um, let's give her a moment of silence. You fought a good fight, Kiki. And to all the family from here at the MBS show, we'd like to wish you our sincerest condolences. That's actually the first I've heard of that. Uh, I actually haven't heard of that. I think, Um, I mean, because you just woke up, probably haven't checked anything much. So, yeah, I mean, I heard it in the afternoon also. So, yeah. I'm actually surprised it didn't get posted on any of the news sites last night because it happened in the afternoon um, yesterday. 1.30 a.m. actually was in the morning. I think it was a while from when it actually happened to when Tara kind of made the announcement because I heard about it in the afternoon. And it was, yeah, it was very, very heart-wrenching. It kind of like threw off my whole day. I was like, I was actually in tears by the end of the day. I woke up hearing this news and wow, just imagine waking up to that news. It's no fun. There goes the Saturday. Oh well, life goes on. Yep. Speaking of that, let's go into the news time and check out what else has been happening. In today's news time, two new character collections will be on sale soon. Check out the links in the show notes below. If you have always wanted a pony blind bag but just couldn't get them or you want one specific pony but you can't spend enough money, you don't have enough money or you don't have a credit card or something like that, you can always get the new character collection sets. These character collection sets are sets that have a specific theme to them. So, for example, here, there's the wedding set, which includes Twilight Sparkle, Shining Armor, and Princess Cadence. Geez, that's the first time that all three ponies are relevant to the theme. There will be two new sets that will come out soon, and that will be the Cake Family, Babysitting Fun, and the Elements of Harmony Friends. So what's so special about these two new sets? Instead of having only three, you will get more than three. 
in the Cake Family Babysitting Fun Set. It includes Mr. and Mrs. Cake, Pound and Pumpkin Cake, Nurse Red Heart, and Pinkie Pie, so you have someone to throw out the hospital. In the Elements of Harmony, friends, you include Fluttershy, The Manticore, Rarity, Steven Magnet, and Nightmare Moon. I don't know whether his name is really going to be Steven Magnet, but check out the pics in the show notes. What do you guys think? Yeah, I doubt they will call him a Steven Magnet. That's more of a famine name. Most of the people like, involved in the show, I mean, have embraced it, but I doubt that it will be an official name. Kind of like, uh, well, actually, that's a, <laughs> that's what I'll say, kind of like, uh, how Dr. Hoops, though, but they've actually kind of, they have adopted that in a, in a manner of speaking. Yes, they uh, have. They just spell it, they just drop the W. But, uh, so, no, that's actually a horrible example, so ignore that. <laughs> ignore so no, like, me! Like <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, like, for the most part, they don't typically use, uh, fan names. Uh, well, Lyra Hawks is a good example. But yeah, uh, believe for, like, uh, just for legal reasons, they have, they try and avoid that kind of thing. Yeah, they will. So Norman, what do you think of the sets? Are you going to get them? Obviously, yes. And finally, Fluttershy has a new main style. <laughs> I'm just happy finally Mrs. Kate comes out correctly because prior to this, I've always been harping on this for previous episodes. They couldn't get the character for Cupcake correct in the toys. Okay. No, I, I believe with the, uh, the, the uh, that one set, I believe I've seen previews of it. This is actually not the first time that I've seen previews because there was a toy fair some months back. And I believe it's just Stephen Magnus just referred to as the Sea Serpent or something like that. But um, I tell you what, I've been collecting all the micro series sets and I love the cake one. That one, I can't wait to get made But the one I'm really waiting for, and I forget what it's called, but it has Silver Spoon and Smarty Pants in it. Oh, oh wow, also, I can't wait. Is it? There's also one with um, Queen Chrysalis, right? Yes, I think that's the same oh, that set. Was the first one. Queen Chrysalis. First Chrysalis isn't oh, out yet. Yeah. Oh, micro series. Oh, okay, okay. No, the the toy line is known oh, as the, right. the micro series. It's it's an off branch of the of the blind bag. So Norman, what about the next news topic? You want to take that? Alrighty then, My Little Pony 2013 Comic Con exclusive. If you didn't know, Hasbro will be attending this year's Comic Con. Like the previous year, they will be selling exclusive Comic Con toys. Last year, Hasbro's exclusive My Little Pony toys was the fashion style derby hose. According to USA Today, this year's exclusive My Little Pony toy is going to be DJ Pony 3. And here are some quotes from the article. A fan favorite who appeared in the first season of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, DJ Pony 3, $49.99, makes her debut with a Comic Con exclusive. Even DJ Pony 3 special packaging lights up, says Hasbro's Donna Tobin, Senior Vice President, Global Brand Marketing for My Little Pony. Everything about her offering really enhanced her character. In the cartoon, she had a little throwback to the 80s. She put a needle on an actual vinyl record. Toby adds, a younger girl might not have picked that up, but our older fans pick it up immediately and love it. And we love that about her too. Links and pictures can be found in the show notes. So, who's going to Comic Con? Sadly, I will not. <laughs> oh, no. Clockwork, what about you? Uh, the way the ticket sells for that event, it's almost impossible to get in if you haven't gone a previous year. Oh, God. You mean people buy tickets one year in advance? No, it's people, if you've bought, the way they do the ticketing is if you, you have to be a member of International Comic Con to buy a ticket. They oh. only sell. They only sell them online, and if you if you attended a previous year, you get first dibs. I see. Oh my! I I like this wow. vinyl packaging, and wow! It lights <laughs> up. Well, let's just I, say that eBay is going to get rich. <laughs> oh, let let me say this: I did not attend last year. I still got my hands on a derpy, and I got her for retail price from Hasbro Direct, and I plan to do the same thing with this because that is the most. I've seen what this uh, DJ Pony uh, doll looks like, and it is probably the most fantastic one they've done so far. Do you think that this is going to be a fashion style size, or just a normal brushable size? Uh, the, the details in it, and if they do have it light up, which means batteries will need to be in it, I think it'll be probably close to derpy size. They tend to go big for the exclusives. Yep. Mm, okay. I have a few Transformers agree. exclusives, and yeah, they're huge. Awesome, awesome. So send some pictures our way once you get it. No, no, right. I, I want one too. I want one too. So Hasbro Direct, I'm going to go for that one. 
Oh. Yeah, send pictures, and by pictures, I mean send me the pony. <laughs> yeah, uh, the way Hasbro works with their exclusives, Toys R Us will do. Toys R Us may do exclusive too, but just have to wait and see. They did one last year. But the way their Hasbro's exclusives work is that about a week after SDCC, they will actually put all their exclusives on their Hasbro toy shop, and but they sell out fast. Just be expect that. And I'm surprised this one hasn't fallen off a truck in China just yet. Wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> Give it time. Mm-hmm. So while we're waiting for that to fall off a truck in China, let's move on to guest time. Today's guest time, we have two awesome, awesome people. We have Tim, who is once again the Director of Public Relations, correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll be Interim Director of uh, Public Relations. I'm taking over for uh, Macarian, uh, who was our former Media and Public Relations. He had to uh, step down for, uh, briefly. All right, and we also have Clockwork, who's the Director of Operations. These two are working on Everfree Northwest, an exciting convention coming up in, I believe, less than a month from now. So Clockwork and Tim, welcome aboard. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. So Clockwork, can you explain a bit about what you do for the con? Con ops in general, we kind of act as almost a information and communication hub for the con. We don't do that much prior to the convention, but we play a pivotal role during Basically, we have a place where people can come, be they an attendee, be they a staff member. If they have a question, they can come to us, and we do our best to answer. We also have a way to get a hold of pretty much everybody involved with be via radio or phones. So if we need to get a hold of somebody to come answer a question or take care of something, we can get a hold of them. Well, we handle like the lost and found. We'll, uh, along with security, uh, well, our royal guard, um, we take care of like peace bonding. Uh, you know, we're in charge of the radios. We have our own dispatch system to uh, keep all the different departments working together. I mean, we're a staff of several hundred people, uh, broken into different teams or departments, and a lot of these have to work together not only prior to the con but during the con and. Uh, we kind of help make sure everybody is actually talking to each other so that everything can go smoothly. All right. So if I'm not mistaken, this year's Everfree Northwest is going to be in the Seattle Tacoma Hilton? Yes, it is. That's correct. All right. Awesome. So um, tell us a bit more about the venue, how it's going to look like. Well, Clockwork, I think uh, I think you've uh, – have you actually seen the uh, convention itself, uh, the uh, uh, convention hall? I've actually been to that hotel several times for a previous convention, so I know it fairly well. At least one thing that means it's good for conventions if there have been multiple conventions there before. Yes, it's actually a very great venue for a con, um, you know, between about 2,000 to 4,000 attendees. It's great for that because it has its own convention hall. It's not like a lot of of the hotels I've been to where they uh, they just kind of stick you in the ballroom or the conference rooms. Oh. that are attached to the, to the hotel because we will we do have a few uh, events and stuff going on in what would be the uh, hotels. Uh, you know, conference rooms that are actually attached to the hotel, and uh, we have we have actually a good sized ballroom we're using for our vendor hall. But then there's the actual convention center, that's a uh, a separate building, and that's where where all our main events are going to take place, and all uh, the autographs and uh, stuff like that. And there's some nice, real big open areas for people to just kind of mingle together and hang out. Um, you know, we won't we won't we shouldn't happen to be like you know kicking people out. Because they're you know just hanging out in the halls loitering because we have these two large foyers in both lo- in on both both the hotel and over at the convention center that people can just sit down relax uh, maybe say you're an artist who didn't get a table at the vendor table you can sit down there and draw collaborate that sounds good that's like a lot of nice free space to run around yeah it's actually it's actually a real rate location it's right next to the Marriott which uh, we are not using the Marriott this year like last year. You know, who knows down the road when we as we grow, but um, our overflow hotel is actually the Holiday Inn, which was our main hotel last year. But that's just for rooms. We're not splitting our events into two different locations. It's just an overflow for rooms. All right. Yes, thankfully, uh, there is no uh, hill this year. (laughs) There is no hill. Okay. It's going to be from the 5th to the 7th of July, correct? Yep. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Awesome. So, um... Just a question. Why do you choose this date? <laughs> I tend to be curious like that. I hope you don't mind. Trust me, it was not an ideal uh, time slot. We were very well aware of other things going on that same weekend, as well as Indeed. being yeah, being a huge family holiday weekend for us in the States as well. In fact, I'm going to be 
instead of with my family, we're supposed to like I normally am. I'm going to be up in Seattle watching a fireworks show up there with everybody else. But working with any hotel, you work around their schedule, and hotels like this, they book a lot of events. And you almost always have to have things scheduled more than a year out to get the dates you want. And unfortunately, to get this hotel, to get at a price we felt comfortable, this was the date we were stuck with. Right, and it's not only the uh, 4th of July weekend we're contending with, uh, we're also contending with uh, a couple of other large conventions that uh, has a little bit of overlap with the uh, type of uh, guests we're expecting to bring in for this convention. So uh, there is some slight competition, I would say. Uh, there, uh, if you, uh, would you agree with that, uh, Clockwork? Yeah, it was, it was, is it Anime Expo that's that same weekend? Uh, the Anime Expo, and uh, I mean, which is in California, a little further away, so not as much competition. But there's also uh, Anthrocon uh, in uh, yeah. Philadelphia, I believe. So yes, that's sir. the I think that's the largest uh, furry convention. So I think there might be a little bit of uh, there might be some stuff uh, there as well. There, there's a few people I know that because of they're just so used to going to Anthrocon that they did opt out of traveling to the West Coast, but that's that's mostly people who are already on the East Coast anyway, so it's not, we didn't lose that many, but there's also another uh, Florida Supercon, I believe, is also that same weekend as well, but again, that didn't really impact us very much. Man, I mean, I wish if there were half that many cons down here in Malaysia, we would be more than happy. <laughs> if you really look at the convention scene, there's probably something going on almost every weekend for, for something, because almost every genre every show has has its fandom um the doctor who has like a couple of conventions already uh um, and they're they're trying to actually get one going up in the seattle area that i would love to attend to myself and so guys there's going to be so many things happening there's even a cosplay competition and i wish i was there for that but what is really attracting me towards you know efnw if i were to go would be this crystal games challenge that i just found out about so guys can you tell us more about this Crystal Games Challenge, I know actually quite a bit about this. Uh, let me go ahead and bring that up. Basically, the Crystal Games Challenge is a game jam we're going to be doing uh, in conjunction with the Gaming Cult. Uh, the Gaming Cult is... Uh, we actually have a few members in the Gaming Cult that are also on Everfree Northwest staff. And uh, it's just going to be a, a game jam. It's going to be on June 22nd through the 24th. And all going to be done online, so... Anyone from around the world can partake. Uh, so if you guys actually could uh, get a bunch of your friends together and make a game, and it doesn't have to be a video game per se, you can make like a card game or a board game. And oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Will drinking games count? <laughs> uh, I, I don't think drinking games quite counts. Oh, sadly. I'm sorry. But, but this is a yeah, great thing know. because now finally you know people over here and all over the world can start contributing. Right, and uh, it's going to be, uh, just check out the Gaming Cult's website, their Facebook, their Twitter. They're going to be releasing information about this on all of their uh, so uh, their sites and social media. Actually, I've done a few game jams uh, myself. I actually went to school to uh, be a game art, uh, to make uh, art assets for video games. So I've done a few game jams in my time. Uh, the idea is to, in a... 24, 48 hour period depends on the game jam. In this case, it will be 48 hours. Uh, everyone, uh, you get a common theme as well as possibly restrictions. Uh, usually just a theme though. Uh, and you have to build a game based on it. For example, uh, you may get a theme like something simple like light, and then you have to build a game based on the concept of light. That, that's not the theme. I'm just using it as an example. So nobody start making games based on the concept of light. <laughs> okay. But, uh, and then you have, 20, like you have 48 hours to make it. And after 48 hours, you show what you have. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Yep. So all of you who are listening, no matter where you are, you don't have to be in the States, all Malaysian listeners, this is your chance to contribute to the Everfree Northwest Convention that's happening from the 5th to 7th of July next month. And so there's another contest, you're having a PMV contest, right? Yes, and actually before I became the director of media, I am actually was running that, so I'm still actually running that contest. That's my baby. Oh, awesome. So tell us a bit more about it. Uh, it's basically, um, it actually has two uh, components. It's the uh, PMV contest, which is the uh, Pony Music Video Contest. Um, and, uh, yeah, you just submit a PMV. Actually, previous uh, 
Pony music videos are acceptable, uh, as long as they were made after, I believe, was February 5th. Let me, actually, let me look that up. Uh, while I'm looking that up, uh, you can also... So, but there's also another uh, segment called the Pony Movie Video. This one is, uh, this is for non-music entries. So you see stuff like uh, people uh, pony, uh, adding pony clips to movie, like a movie trailer. soundtracks? Yeah, movie soundtracks. That has its own category. Something like Inglorious Ponies. Exactly. Um, now, it, this does have a... Uh, the same rating as the convention. It still has to be uh, PG. So, I mean, it can't have, like, a undue swearing, for example. Like, uh, you can't have, like... Of orange? <laughs> <laughs> right. Again, no pun intended. <laughs> so, everything, it still has to be PG. You, of course, can have a cleaned-up version of Clockwork Orange, where it's not so... Poor, like, a, again, I mean, it's still, like, a, using the video of My Little Pony... So, it, uh, so the actual visuals won't be that bad, and as long as you clean up the language, for the most part, we probably can work with it. But the content does have to be PG, because uh, this is a family-friendly convention, and so everything we show has to fit within that family-friendly uh, overture. Yep. I'm actually bringing up the rules now. It is Actually, it ends on June 16th, so there's only about a... Uh, week left before you we close the submissions and yes february 3rd uh if you've made a if it's was made since february 3rd it's eligible to be submitted so we uh, and actually there's no restrictions on uh, who can submit so actually again malaysian bronies if you have a pmv either music or non-music you want to send in send it in you're eligible awesome awesome so now there's more ways to be a part of this convention so far away <laughs> So, guys, would you like to announce your lineup for the convention? Who's coming and who's, you know, I mean, not just all who's coming. You can't read your whole guest list, but, you know, people of interest who are coming. Of course. Um, now, the uh, voice actors that we have coming, we have Peter New, who plays Big Mac. Uh, we have Andrew Francis, who plays Shining Armor. We have Michelle Kreber, who does uh, the singing voice of Sweetie Belle and who is also Apple Bloom. And we have... Tabitha St. Germain, who does Rarity, uh, Luna, uh, and who does, like, uh, so many other voices. I yeah, mean, I can't, I can't the other voices. Yeah, I mean, I, I, doesn't she also do, like, uh, I think she did Derpy, uh, the original one, uh, the yep. original Derpy, as well Bruce as... Bruce Redheart. Uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, uh Mrs. Kate. Finish. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Just versatile, we're so, uh, no, we're happy to have all of them to, uh, we're happy to have all of them. We also have a ton of uh, guests coming from... Uh, we actually have uh, sent out a bunch of press releases lately. Uh, like our gaming uh, press release. I mean, we're going to have Legends of Equestria is going to be there. Um, um, Blue Green Blood Bronies, the gaming cults. Uh, My Little Pony role-playing is magic. Actually, a group that I've done some work for, My Little Investigations, is going to be there. Oh, you were involved in that too. Uh, yeah, I'm actually a field character animator for My Little Investigations. Ah. So, so yeah, um, yeah, I do uh, Every Northwest. Uh, yeah, if you want my whole uh, brony profile, yeah, I've done uh, work for My Little Investigations. I have um, was an editor for a audio drama for um, Shipping and Handling, which should hopefully be releasing uh, in the next few months, uh, hopefully. And, uh, of course... Uh, working for conventions on top of Everfree Northwest. That is my second year working for it. I've also uh, volunteered at EQLA. So Awesome. That's a nice lineup you got there. Oh, yeah, completely. But, yeah, so to be there, uh, we actually also have a huge musical guest lineup. We have, again, we have Pony Stock again this year. So this is um, this is a hu- uh, this is huge. Again, uh, we're going to have a ton of musicians going to be playing uh, each Night, uh, each convention night we have, um, so like uh, Friday and Saturday, we're going to have a uh, concert. Ooh. We're going to have 20 artists actually performing. Can you give us a few of them? Yeah, we're we going to have a list. I have the list right here. Uh, awesome. We have Alex S., Mike the Microphone, Michael A., Voodoo Pony, Don DeVore, Pony One Kenobi, 
from Jimen TD, um, Durpidity, That Son of a Mitch, Art Attack, Veroni Mike, Tarby, Halos Foss, F3, uh, Fanny. Uh, yeah, Fanny, Meta Joker, Replacer, I Be a Brony Rapper, Odyssey, Silva Hound, Mando Pony, and Acoustic Brony. As Silva well as, and Mando are going, whoa! Yep, as well as Michelle Kreber. That is a fantastic lineup. You know, if you guys probably can't make it for Brony Palooza, this is just as good. Oh, completely. Again, we, we pride ourselves on our pony stock uh, offering. Another thing that we're very proud of this year, we actually also have, for all the writers out there, we have a very, very strong writing line. We're actually going to have like a pretty comprehensive writing, uh, line, like a lineup of writing uh, panels. Uh, yeah, our writing like- track is our writing track is probably our strongest track next to our music track. Right, and actually, we should be releasing a uh, press release announcing our writing track in the next uh, couple of days. Um, yeah, yeah. With, with how just big film fiction is for this fandom, I, I've never seen a fandom where fan fiction was so integrated into it. It's <laughs> part of it's part of our fan, and fan fiction is actually part of our fan in it that you don't see that with other fandoms. And I've been I've been kind of promoting our our, our writing track without going into details to uh, to a lot of places because I just know that's just going to be such a huge attraction. Awesome! I, oh. I do love the fanfix. Um, could you guys just well exclusively announce who might be there? Yeah, I can quickly bring that up. Let me just go ahead and uh, bring that up. Uh, uh, go ahead and uh, talk. We'll go ahead and uh, talk about something else really quickly. I'll go ahead and uh, bring that up. Uh, we'll like, sorry. Well, I, I believe even though the, the the people who are in charge of our writing track are fairly decently known in the fandom, like like Silver Quill. All right, all right. I, I I don't really follow. Honestly, I, I I admittedly I don't really follow the fan fiction scene that that closely, but I do. I'm aware how just how important it is in that fandom. Um, in this fandom, it's 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 one of those kind of crazy things. But you guys, while he pulls that up, any other questions? Well, I do have one, but it's well, okay. Who came up with the idea for Everfree of West? Uh, I do. I, I'm pretty sure. I don't know the full details in that, but I'm pretty sure that was a collaborated work. A lot of the people who are part of our board are the the founding members, including including like uh, Mark Carrion. Um, who is who is the president of the the Pegasi Corp, which is our uh, parent company for Everfree Northwest? They're the ones who actually uh, fund it. But uh, I do believe, like a uh, Bijati, uh, that's the name that should ring a bell. Ah, Bijati, yes. It, it was actually uh, he was actually played a, a major role as well in the con. He's our current co-chair uh, under Royal Guard, and Royal Guard. He's a uh, he is also uh, one of the founding members. Those three names I know uh, fairly well as being kind of a... They kind of came together and decided, let's do something. Okay, awesome, awesome. So uh, I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to speak for them. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, and uh, I have those writing track uh, guests, if uh, awesome. you're ready for me to... Okay, so the guests we have are Silver Quill. Uh, she's actually in charge of uh, the writing track. Uh, she's actually done writing tracks uh, before for conventions such as Anthrocon, and actually has published a few novels. Uh, we have Couch Crusader and uh, Seattle Light, uh, their pre-readers for EQD. Uh, we have Horizon, author of No Regrets and Fuji State. Um, I can't pronounce that one word. It's F-U-G-U-E State. Fugue. Uh, Fugue State. All right. We also have Meester, uh, who is the most prolific proofreader on film, uh, film fiction. We also have Penstroke, author of Past Sins. This is a big oh, one. Oh, Penstroke! Penstroke's going to be there. there. Uh, we also have uh, PK, who is uh, the author of Antipones and EQD Blog Pony. Wow, awesome. Uh, it's got, yeah, Sky Rider is also going to be there. Uh, S.R. Foxley is going to be there. And Totally Not a Brony. Uh, yeah, Sky Rider is the author of Contraptionology co-writer of Skin Horse. Uh, we also have S.R. Foxley, author of Experts from a Filthy Diary. Excerpts from a Filthy, di- filthy Diary. Sorry. <laughs> and Totally Not a Brony is the author of over 70 stories on f- fiction, apparently. Very, very nice. So we got actually quite the lineup. I'm not sure uh, 
which panels uh, these uh, these guys are going to be on. Uh, actually, even if they're not on any of the uh, panels, uh, we will have actually. Uh, we will have a section of time. We'll just that will just be a hangout section uh, for people just hang out with fanfic authors in a kind of like a laid back kind of uh, setting. So uh, but no, we could, we have a ton again. We have a ton of uh, ride canals, uh, just like going over story and structure and characters and uh, and once you become and uh, just how to get your story out there. Uh, no, it's just. Uh, no, it's just stuff like a very, very comprehensive topic. So just uh, so just so many great panels. So if you want to learn how to uh, how to write uh, some fan fiction or just write overall, uh, it'd be a very, very good uh, track to come and follow. Wow! I wish I could go there because that sounds like an interesting panel. <laughs> Of course it is. I mean, there's not just one panel. They have so many panels and so many awesome, awesome people. So if you're listening to this and you're within the Seattle region, you have no excuse not to be there. Well, I mean, even if uh, you're not in the Seattle region, you can still come down and uh, come and see us. And registration is still open. Uh, it is coming to a close soon, though. It closes on the 15th of uh, June. So it closes this month on the 15th. Uh, so... Uh, so it's almost closed. After that, uh, you would have to buy it at the door. Um, and actually, if you also want to get our supporter badge, or uh, those are actually over half gone. Oh yeah, I heard they're selling fast. Oh, yeah, yeah. Talk they're over half it. gone. And uh, our patron badges are also uh, selling very well, and so those are also uh, heading out as well. Also, we are still looking for volunteers for the convention as well. So if you want to come and join us as a volunteer, we still have openings. I could actually, for example, still I could use a couple more on my media staff as an example. Well, awesome. Yeah, you, know, if, you know, you had an extra, you know, KL to Seattle plane ticket lying around. We won't mind. <laughs> Anyway, now I have to talk to you guys this year off. I actually, sadly, I have to get going. Okay, oh. then. Thank you very much for joining us. Hey, it was a pleasure, guys. Now, I'm actually, I am a listener of your show. I actually quite enjoy it, and I look forward to uh, more of your shows. You're welcome to join us anytime you'd love to. Hey, uh, I may take you up on that offer uh, in the near future. Okay, no hey, problem. You guys have a great one, and look forward to it. All right, All take right. care and have fun on your next podcast. Have a good one. All right, All right thank you. you. So Clockwork, you can hang around, right? Yeah, for a little bit. Um, I also wanted to emphasize on, you know, as far as if anybody was interested in volunteering or joining our, our staff for Everfree, there, there are some decent decent perks for, for doing that. I mean, you're not going to get a free badge this year, but if you uh, come and you, you work and you help with the convention, uh, you get a free pass for next year. Awesome, Ooh, that's awesome. a really, really good offer. So uh, I'm I'm wondering how how much are the registration prices? Uh, I believe it's fifty dollars right now for free reg, and it's only going up to fifty five at the door. And this is for a three day pass, correct? That is correct. There's some talk uh, of, of potentially other kind of badges being available. Um, if say if someone was only going to be there for a day, we do not have that available now. We haven't decided we're going to do that. It is being discussed. Okay, okay. It's still in <laughs> secret, so we can talk about it. <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah, then. I probably, yeah, it's really not one of those things that go out. I'm just kind of letting you guys know that, that that's a, a lot of cons do one day passes. Um, and in fact, uh, because for a lot of people, Saturday is the only day worth going or the only day they can go. And a lot of people will not go to a convention if they have to pay for the whole weekend. Yeah. So we're talking about making one day passes available because we, we are fully aware that could potentially increase our uh, attendees for at least say Saturday or, or even Sunday by quite a lot for those who are maybe on the fence about going, but know that they can't be there the whole weekend. So are kind of like, don't want to spend the fifty dollars if they can't really enjoy the whole thing. Yeah, oh, right, all right. True. And also for fools, it's free, right? It it is free. I believe the the cutoff is uh, twelve. I'd have to look it up. It's, it's, it says here thirty and un, thirteen and under. Right. Okay. Yeah. So so yeah, it's about that. If you have, yeah, it's basically yeah, um, thirteen and under uh, kids get in free. They just have to have a parent or guardian who who's there who is a paid member. 
and they, uh, they do need to be with them pretty much at all times. Um, even for our guests who are under 18, at least they still need uh, parent and guardian permission, but they just don't have to be escorted. Oh, okay. Sounds good. So, my next question is, here's a random question. Will Michelle Kriber hijack the security radio again? You know, it's funny enough, of all the pony cons I've been to in the last year, that keeps coming up. And it, apparently, she wasn't the only one that done that. I guess Lee and Kathy did that at a con as well. <laughs> I don't remember which one. I just love these guys. Uh, and it's been talked about that... Again, my department's the one who kind of has the radios under lock and key. Um, not that someone wouldn't randomly hand her one. It's it was one of those things that it would might be cute, but the only people that would hear it would be on staff, and only if she's on like a certain channel would anybody hear it. So, I mean, we're not setting that up as an event. Well, you know? at least the people <laughs> who run the con are happy about it. Well, at least something exclusive for them. <laughs> yeah, but no, we're we're uh, a lot of cons are. A, are aware that a, a few of the VAs have pulled little stunts like that, and as cute as it is, it um, we they've kind of cracked down on that. To, to really, try to... come on. <laughs> well, because if it was something for our attendees that was cute and for them to enjoy, it'd be one thing. But um, conventions kind of keep a little kind of lock and key under kind of calm chatter because there's constant communication going back and forth to, to make sure the events are running. I mean. I'm just I wouldn't stop her if she wanted to grab a radio. I'm just saying, it's nothing planned. So if it happens, it happens. Well, I, I'll just have to keep my ear on the radio then. <laughs> you, know, what, you know what someone should do is someone should just get her a ham radio and send it to her and see what happens. <laughs> oh, God. Oh just leave God. a radio lying there. Just make it too easy. Oh, God, no. So I'm wondering, do you guys have any panel registration if somebody is interested in doing a panel over there? We did. That's been closed for a while now. Ah, oh, okay. Um, we, we've, we pretty much have all the events we're going to do figured out. We're just figuring out when they're going to be. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Because most of the conventions I've heard saying that, oh, we still have a um, panel open if you're interested, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So here's something interesting. Um, will you guys do a live stream like last year? Okay, I can't talk about that. Ah, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, key. Okay, no problem, no problem. L- let's do you have say any that podcasts that are gonna be there. You know, probably EFN gonna be there. We will have several different media groups there. I do not know all of them because that's this is actually something still being figured out. All any and all media groups that want to attend. They are more than welcome to come and cover the convention if they want to on their own dime. As far as EFN's presence, as far as I know, they're planning to be there. What they're covering and how they're covering it, I cannot discuss. Uh, I I can't really – yeah, that's – unfortunately, I can't get into that because uh, we're still – working on figuring that out exactly how much media coverage we're going to have. Ah, it's cool, it's cool, because, well, these are some of the questions that bronies might ask, and, well, I'm a brony, and I'm asking it. Yeah, yeah no, we actually get asked this everywhere we go, and um, once everything is finalized, we will make an announcement, and considering the convention is literally in 27 days, um, we'll probably be making one within the next couple of weeks. We have uh, a couple staff meetings left, and um, more than likely we'll have everything figured out uh by then. Oh, awesome. Can't wait. All so, right, so um, you can just uh, send over the press releases, you know, so we'll package it up. Yeah, well, yeah once those, uh, that's actually, you know, Tim kind of, he handles a lot of that. Once mm-hmm. we actually have it, information that's, you know, this is exactly what we're doing, this is exactly what's going on, he'll send uh, that information out to the various uh, news organizations that we're working with. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So one more thing. Um, Last year, you'd have an exclusive Wheel of Fine shirt. Will you guys be doing the same thing this year? Um, as far as I know, we are still working with, with Leela of Fine. Um, I don't know the full details of of the shirt, because uh, I do believe we are going to have a new con shirt this year. Uh, I can't, go, uh, can't discuss what it, it'll involve, uh, but we'll actually be selling some of those ourselves this time, rather than uh, Wheel of Fine selling it. The nice thing about working with... Uh, Wheel of Fine is that they're an official licensor for Hasbro, which means that by going through them, we can actually use the characters from the show and not get in trouble. 
Yay! Awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah, so there's been a few other cons that they've done their own shirts through other means, and it's a uh, it, it's kind of questionable when they do that. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, Licensing. You know, they, Licensing is magic. Licensing the rights to all of this stuff, and at any point in time, they can say, nope, this con's not happening. Oh, well. Yeah, that's what I'm scared of a lot of things. A lot, a lot of times, when, you know, I see small cons, it's like, um, okay. Well, the smaller not- cons, smaller cons are kind of, kind of go under the radar. They're not paid attention to it's the bigger ones the better no, no name ones um in fact you know you've heard us mention anthrocon which is the largest for a convention in the world at well over uh, four thousand att- definitely it has over one thousand four thousand attendees but yep. you know hasbro has been known to sneak in there because they're aware of the the size of the pony uh, fandom within the furry community and they've they've actually snuck representatives into that con and had to shut down events going on there ah so the first two Rainbow Dash isn't who you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the Team Fortress Spy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, but, but Everfree Northwest, we actually have a really great relationship with both DHX and Hasbro. We actually work directly with them. We don't we don't go behind their backs. We don't try to see what we can get away with. We actually contact them and ask them, can we do this? Wow, awesome, awesome. That's good. Awesome. You you know what? Uh, I think like right now we're kind of limited to what we can ask about this year's con. So I want to talk about last year's con. So how was last year? Like I heard there was a lot of awesome thing happening there. Yeah, I was not on staff officially last year, but I was there um, as one of their uh, paid, uh, sponsors, and uh, it was to me it was an amazing convention uh, with. In comparison to a lot of the cons I've been to, for the size of that con, for being, you know, around 1,500 people there. And that's still a relatively small con when you're talking about, like, the big media conventions like PAX or Comic-Con. But, you know, for someone who's, you know, kind of part of that more furry side of things, that's a really decent-sized convention for just a group of fans to come together for a show that's only been around for a year and but it felt very tight-knit everybody was very friendly very happy very close together so for as many people were there you felt very included with what was going on there was just a lot of positive energy from the attendees uh we, we had a lot of really great events Music uh, was was one of our biggest things last year as it is this year with pony stock uh Thankfully, this year, uh, we're not dealing with having to shuttle people up, t- you know, 12 stories to get to the concert. <laughs> well, that hill, it, I, I'm guessing those Pegasus were planning that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the Holiday Inn was a, was really great to us. They We can't complain with... Uh, about their customer service, but it wasn't it wasn't the best venue for what we were trying to pull off. It's a part of our move to the Holiday Inn. It's just it logistically it works a lot better for us that uh, we can have everything all together in a very close space, where we're not having to deal with having to get go through the elevators and stairs like that. Okay, okay. Uh, I have to say that last year you guys went big. My my motto is usually. Go big or go home. And last year, you guys went really big. There is a story behind all that. It is shareable. Is that they weren't planning to be that big. Oh, my. One of the reasons why the Holiday Inn was even picked to begin with is because they were originally only expecting to maybe have 300, possibly 500 attendees. That was their goal. So they were planning to be a small con. They weren't expecting it to be very big. Last year... BronyCon happened first, mm-hmm. and everybody was just blown away that that con went from from just having these small little meetups of a few, maybe a few hundred people to suddenly four thousand. Yeah, it's it, it was an astronomical growth in their attendance that no one's ever seen before, something like that, and it, it almost created a precedent for the other big name cons at that time to be big and. People started to kind of expect a great show, and but really, it was the announcement of the VA guests. I think that just had everybody just flocking and, and wanting to go, and so excited. 
And when we saw, when the con originally sold out at about 500 people, because that was about as much as they could do, but there was just this huge outcry from the community that, that they wanted to attend, that a decision was made to expand. And unfortunately, it's not like they, could, they couldn't they could suddenly just cancel on the hotel that they were at and get another one. So they expanded into another hotel down the street, and that was the Marriott. And that's, uh, you've ever heard of the infamous hill, that's where that kind of came in because people yeah, kind of had to walk a few places, blocks. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, yeah. There was, there's a pretty steep hill where the hotels are and people kind of, we did have a show going back and forth, but a lot of people ended up just kind of walking and it, it, it's, it's pretty steep. So it, it kind of, it, it can kind of wear you out. You know, this was the middle of summer, so oh, it was God, pretty, no. pretty warm. So that hill's still there, but we don't have to, really don't have to deal with it because the hotel is like literally on that hill, but people aren't going to have to go back and forth like they did. That would be hell for us because the temperature right here is about 35 Celsius in the daytime. And moist. (laughs) Don't forget moist. Oh, yes. Moist and that. Yeah. I can imagine Jack Split running up that hill right now. Oh, boys. No, but seriously speaking, um, your convention last year was awesome. It's the kind of situation where I wish I could go there, but I'm here and life sucks. We were watching the live stream, though, and it it was enjoyable. It was really fun. Yeah, and it's because of audiences spread out. We're definitely going to be covered more than one way or another. Whether we live stream or not, there we will still have panels recorded, especially our, our big events. Everything will be documented. So even if we don't end up doing it a live show, eventually the stuff that is recorded will be put out there. I know it's not the same. Like with, when we were live streaming and we had the, the chats open, it uh, it allowed people to to feel like they were participating and not just watching it. I mean, um, like with, I know with like with uh, BronyCon, I ended up watching all the videos after the fact just because uh, that same weekend I was busy with other things and had to catch up on it later. I didn't get to see it live. But yeah. it, it was still, still nice to watch. I mean, EQLA, they, uh, you, you know, everybody knows they decided not to live stream this year. And and there's there's multiple reasons why a con would choose not to do that. Because it's for one thing, live streaming at conventions is incredibly rare. True, true. Of the one of the big reasons why a lot of cons did last year is because we all sold out. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. And people we, people we, want to be there. There's us, you know, who you know, no matter how hard we try, unless we get on our boats and start rowing right now, we're not going to be able to make it. Right, and and you know that realization that this fandom has really widespread globally, which is. So unique. That's one of those one little thing. That's one of those another one of those little things that this makes this fandom so unique. Is that we just have this massive global presence. It's not just you know oh you know the, the fans in the states. I, I it always amazes me just how big of a presence we have over in Europe and in and I'm, I'm reminded over and over again how how many great bronies we have over there. You know talented and you know you guys putting on your show from Malaysia. It's you know it's. It, you don't hear about a lot of this from other fandoms. Everything tends to be very, you know, oh, you know, you're the fans, you're, you're fans of it, but you're you only associate with the fans from your region. You don't spread out and do things to other fans. Yep, well, that is true. That is true. And also another thing that I understand is live streaming for any convention is rare. Even BlizzCon, they do it, yet they sell their live streaming sessions. Yeah, it's it's an incredibly rare thing. Some of the larger cons are starting to a- adapt it more and more because of the realization that they, you know, eat, you know, they they sell out. People can't get to their events and they want to promote it and yeah, and, and it's not uncommon. It's very common for cons to be covered by media and documented and they'll even sell the DVDs. But streaming is incredibly rare. Yeah, but I, I think one reason why streaming is an effective tool is it's just like you want to promote it, you want to show the atmosphere. And honestly speaking for myself, whenever I see any convention, it makes me so jelly that I want to collect money and go to the States. Same here. And it's it puts me in the front row it's because, you know, I don't have to sit there. and fight. Not to say that I don't want to be there, but I'm getting the next best thing right now. So... It's basically something I love, and I remember when I was uh, listening to the Brony Khan's live stream last year, I got ear raped along with 4,000 4, other people around the world when Bree shouted in the mic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but honestly, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you don't want to 
be in that situation. I don't mind being there sitting next to the sweaty fat guy. <laughs> but, I don't but, mind yeah. either. I mean, you know, it's it's being there is the real thing. But unless, you know, you're going to start putting 3D holographic projections <laughs> of everyone next to me, I've got the... With, live streaming is the next best thing. True, 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 true. Yep, yep. And that's all, that's all kept in mind, specifically for those who we know can't join us. Unfortunately, the downside of live streaming is that there may be people who do have the means to go, but choose not to because they have the mentality, oh, why should I go? I can just watch the live stream. You banned that IP in the whole Phoenix area. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's it's as sad as it sounds, there are some people that the only thing they really care about is maybe uh, seeing what's going on in like the panels or the VAs and their discussions. They don't really have the same enthusiasm of just being there and part of the crowd and, you know, sharing the energy. Cause like, I know you guys, you guys sound like if you were going to be there, if you had the option, you know, you'd just be in the thick of it. You don't, you don't want to watch it live stream because, Oh, Hey, I can just watch the panels for live stream. You, you want to be part of the experience. True, the only advantage true. of watching it on a video is the rewind button. No, right, the, only, right. the only advantage of watching on the live stream is just, I want to go to the toilet. <laughs> I can just go oh, to my home. The best seat in the house is the one at home. True, true. So with all the live streaming, that's all in good. But what about food? We haven't talked about food. And food is important. Well, like most conventions, Ever Free is not providing food directly to our guests. Uh, the uh, hotel has has a restaurant it has a bar um there's potential that there may be a uh a kind of a snack bar open over at the convention hall and that that'll that'll be the hotel they have a they have a spot that that i've seen them use before at other cons they don't always open it but they'll be places where you can get like muffins and candy bars and drinks at you know hotel prices oh, but there's <laughs> There's also a few other restaurants nearby in fairly decent walking distance, though it'd be better if you have a car. And we're actually uh, not that far from, you know, we're actually putting together a kind of a comprehensive guide of the area that, that we're in for Seattle and SeaTac. I know that you're attached to the airport, correct? Because this, this, this Hilton is next to the airport. Oh, yeah, it's literally across the street. Awesome. How much is the plane ticket to the U.S. again? <laughs> The Seattle International Airport, that's right there, or the, C- or the SeaTac. Um, yeah, it's it's literally, we're right next door to it. We're putting together kind of a guide to show kind of the local attractions and places to go eat, because there's lots of restaurants up. Seattle's a big food town, and really, it, it, we're right next to a light rail, a kind of a kind of an above-ground subway. And it, it'll take you just one stop away. Uh, I forget the name, like Tukwila is the name of the area. It's right next to SeaTac, and they have a lot of places to go eat. You can go downtown. You can visit the International District. They have Chinatown. Uh, there's just lots of places to go eat down there. It's it's like a half hour ride if people want to go visit Seattle, uh, the heart of Seattle, and uh, see the culture there. There's a lot to see in Seattle. Though. I mean, I could I could spend uh, quite a while just talking about all the attractions people could go there and see that there's still. Uh, Pike's Place, which has a bunch of markets and restaurants down there. Um, you know, there's also the Westfield Mall that's just the South Center Westfield Mall. I believe that's what it's called. It's just uh, east of the of where we're holding the convention. People have been known uh, to venture over that way and hang out at the mall because they've got like an arcade and places to eat, places to shop. So that's you good. know, we're going to have a lot at the con itself. But we are aware that not everybody, not people, don't go there just for the panels. Some, you know, me myself, when I go to cons, I don't really participate in panels. I'm mostly just hanging out with friends. That is probably the number one thing people go to cons to do, just just to hang out. Mm-hmm. Everything mm-hmm. that we do, the panels, the concerts, the guests, that's all just part of the show, the entertainment yeah. while you're there. People also need some downtime away from the con. You know, they'll go, they'll go with groups and they'll, they'll hit the Hang bars, the they'll hit the restaurants, they'll hit the malls. The yeah, you just you just relax. Uh, I I found that the, the the cons where people say, I had the most amazing time in my life, and you ask them why, it's because I just got to see all these great people that I only know online and I got to hang out with them all weekend long and they're just so amazing. I, I so rarely hear when people are gushing over con that it was like, oh, because this panel was so amazing. I mean, sometimes it'll be, oh, I got to meet so-and-so a uh, voice actor, but almost every person I've ever met when I ask them, 
why did you have fun at this con? It's because the people that they were with. True, true. Well, for us, it'll be the panels because that's all we can see. Uh, the other convention, I mean, since we don't talk about the one in February that <laughs> I bring up sometimes is Winter Moon Atlanta. Have you heard of that one? I heard it fell through. <laughs> yeah, it didn't make it. That's the thing. So, but that I mean, was, I don't know why, but you no, know, it was um, quite sad to see them go. No, that one was just because Hasbro was not dealing with people during, okay. you, you know, the time period where Hasbro was on lockdown from the community, just um, trying to figure out what they can do. Yeah, those days. those were the times where the dark days. Yeah, convention yeah. goers were kind of um, stuck. Who wanted to do everything official with them? Yeah, that that kind of impacted Midwestria uh, as well this year. And it was sad to see them not put on a show. I didn't get to go last year, but I I hear they're trying to come back next year. Candlelight Garden sounds like they keep on trying to come back, but that may be one of those cons that just kind of we have to just put the call it retired. Uh, Candlelight Gardens is retiring? Well, they didn't, they're not putting on a show this year. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. They they tried to raise money, but it was uh, it, it wasn't the most successful con. I I hear it had it had its issues. I wasn't there. I can't I can't speak of yeah, it how it was. Issues. Yeah, it had its issues, and they had some problems putting on another show this year. And uh, they tried to, to do some fundraising, but it didn't didn't work out. So they they may just have to call it quits. I mean, it. We, Honestly, it's been said before, we have way, United States specifically, we have way too many conventions going on. Um, and it, Send it's some over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's causal. We're, we're kind of, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot with, with what we try to do. It, it's for, for our, it's one thing to have regional conventions, but when you have like every state and all the major cities trying to pull one off, I mean, I, there's like three in Texas alone. And, yeah, and I'm aware. That I'm aware there's like another one in California besides EQLA, I believe. Oh, if I'm not mistaken, um, Texas has two going on right now, two or three. I'm not 100 percent sure. I know there's Night My Night Dallas. That's in November, and one coming out soon, right? Uh, okay, well, yeah, I believe there was a third, but it may have may have fallen over. Maybe that's what it is. But yeah, uh, Fiesta Equestria. I have to say, I'm not involved in that. Con, but I wish I could go because it sounds like they are going to be putting on one heck of a show. True indeed, because I seen the promo video from EFN, and they have it down really good. What they've done, everything they've done leading up, is some of the most professional things I've seen any con actually do. It's like whoever is in charge of that, whoever they seem like they're people that have experience with this. A lot of these cons, even like BronyCon and and Everfree and Equally, we're we have some people of experience either in cons or other business fields that are related, but we're all learning as we go. Fiesta Crusher is the first one I've seen where it's like they got their act together in, in a way. I mean, they're not going to be, in, you know, they're going to be a decent size, I believe, as well. Mm, true. I, if I if the video is right, they're using the whole hotel, if I remember right. Of all the ones that I can't make it to, that's one that I I would really wish I could go because it's not that too far from where I live. Like, BronyCon's on the other side of the, the country for me, so it's like trying to get to that is, is rather difficult, even though I wish I can go as well. True, true. I don't know. It's difficult I mean, for you. Imagine what it's like for us. <laughs> no, if but, we go there, we're, we're, we're on a mission. Well, it's like, well, BronyCon's just flying over the Atlantic seaboard, right? True, I think so, yes. And we'll stop yeah. by the, uh, Washington Airport. I, I'm not sure if Washington has an airport, but... Baltimore International. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Uh, I don't know. Lands in Baltimore, I know that flight goes there. Yeah. yeah. But if I'm not mistaken, um, Night by Night Dallas, Chef Sandy from Bronyville is uh, is involved in that. and I believe he's the uh, chair, actually. Yeah, he's yeah he's the chair. And yep. from what I heard, he has 10 years of con experience. So, Night Night, Night Dallas might be a success. Yeah, um, it will I'm, be. That's why it was dubbed SandyCon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one looks like it'll be hopeful. I'm, I'm, I, I think that their decision to hold it later in the year is going to prove to, to be very uh, key to their success because I, I think one of the reasons why we've been having so much trouble uh, is that we've got all these cons trying to go on and everybody wants to do it in spring and summer. And no one wants – everybody wants to do it like at the end of the school year or during the summertime. 
everybody seems really reluctant about doing a convention during the fall, which I think is a huge missed opportunity, and it would have allowed the fandom to kind of spread itself out a little bit better and not be so much competition because we, we shouldn't be in competition with each other. I think that mm-hmm. we're a community and, you know, we're all just trying to put on a show uh, for people to come to and enjoy. And, you know, we shouldn't be trying to steal attendees and guests from each other. And uh, a little bit of that tit for tat has been going on. And, you know, we've been hurting ourselves. We haven't been helping ourselves be a stronger community at large. We've actually been you know, it's, it's been counterproductive. True, true. I mean, a little bit of healthy competition is okay, but if you're trying to kill one another, that's kind of counterproductive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't talk about the relationship between Everfree and BrodyCon last year, but, you know, this year we, we definitely are a lot closer together and work together. Um, yeah, EQLA and Everfree have, have always worked together from the beginning. I've seen the banner at the website, so that's proof. All right, so that wraps up the guest time today. Clockwork, thank you very much for joining us. And Tim, if you're listening to this, thank you very much too. Thanks for having me. No problem, it's our pleasure. So, before we go, some shout-outs. Norman, do you have any shout-outs? Well, I have to say a big thank you to Clockwork and Pony Tim for coming on. And thank you for coming on. And Clockwork, you're always welcome to come on as a guest host. All right, yeah, you guys can contact me anytime. I'll just let you know when I'm free. All right, then. All right, no problem. And as for me, a big shout out to Black Griffin and the United States Navy 7th Fleet Band Far East Edition. Thank you very much for an awesome show you put on in Kuala Lumpur on Tuesday. And to the family of Kiki Habib, we're very, very sorry to hear about the news and now deepest condolences from me and my family and as well as the MBS show. So, Clockwork, do you have any shout outs to give? Yeah, definitely to the family of Kiki. Um, I think they sh- should expect... Still some massive support from this fandom. We're not going in away anytime soon. A shout out to all of the uh, Everfree Northwest staff, especially uh, to a couple of my good friends in there. Uh, Flip Sate, who's the head of our business, who I was filling in for today. And one of my best friends who's part of the con, uh, Public Domain. He doesn't really listen to this stuff, but I just want to get his name out there. He's kind of, he's our head of our legal department. Awesome, awesome. Oh, right, one, one more thing I have to say. Um, Crockwork, good luck on Everfree Northwest. I wish you all the success. Thanks, man, and maybe one year we'll see you there. I hope I can go. <laughs> you can come here as well, you know? <laughs> I, I have the same problem you guys have going over there. Actually, the one big con I really, really want to go, if I can swing it sometime, is Buck. Ooh. We're not in the UK, we're in Malaysia. No, but he's, I, I, he's I in the same boat. We're in the same boat. We understand. He understands us. And the rest. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm just saying that if I was to, to go overseas, Buck's the one I want to go to. True, true, you guys should start at MalaysiaCon. Kind of. So. Sometime, maybe. You know what, then? Let's work on it. <laughs> <laughs> and a final shout-out from me goes out to you, Tasha. Welcome back to Malaysia. It's great to have you back with us. Tasha's one of our co-hosts on the MBS show, and she's finally back in Malaysia for good. So, yep, Tasha, welcome back. Yay, welcome back. If you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at the MBS show at gmail.com. And if you'd like to email us personally, you can reach Norman at norman at the MBS show.com. And you can reach my email at daniel at the MBS show.com. You can also reach us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at the MBS show. Mine is at St. Pinky, S T P I N K I E. And I am at Norman Sanzo. And Clockwork, do you have Twitter? Yes, I do. I pretty much use the same handle everywhere. It's just Master Clockwork. <laughs> Master, Master Clockwork. Clockwork. All, All right. right, we'll put that in the show notes. And um, you can also reach us on our website. You can reach us at thembsshow.com. You can subscribe to us and rate us on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Head on over to our show notes and like our Facebook page as well. All the links you need are available. And Clockwork, if you would like to find out more about Everfree Northwest, where can we go? Uh, you can go straight to our site, everfreenorthwest.com. It's everfreenw.com. Okay, awesome. Ooh. Where we are uh, starting to post a lot more news on that site. So there's uh, we're getting more and more information on there about who who's showing up, all our guests, the events going on. And hopefully very, very soon we will have our schedule up for people to see exactly what panels they can attend. Awesome. awesome, awesome. So, of course, just throw us a link. We'll put it in. So, Clockwork, how could people reach you? Like, um, just basically look at what you do. I heard you say you draw stuff. Uh, are you on Deviant or anything? I don't draw. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, I have a few pieces of artwork on my on my DA page. They're all commissions done that I've paid for or had friends do for me. Um, I, I dabble in some minor writing, but I don't tend to share it. And uh, that involves uh, some of my characters and 
uh, also filling in some of the kind of the gaps and in information the show has. But uh, no, I, I don't. Um, what I do is conventions. I've helped uh, staff at other non pony events like uh, Sakura Con. It's up in Seattle. It's a major anime convention. I was part of the EQLA staff, uh, head of their logistics. I plan to be at PAX as just an attendee, but eventually want to try to join their staff as well. Awesome, awesome. So, yeah, what I do is cons. I mean, if I if I had the opportunity, I'd be over at BronyCon on their staff. Uh, I really wish I could be on staff for Brony Can that's happening uh, in August, but I, I'm unable to attend that convention. You, oh, okay. you you know what? You inspire me to do conventions because hearing you talk about conventions, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, I've helped out with other conventions in the past. Um, you know, there's a, you know, there's Kimura Con. It's up in the Portland, Vancouver area. I've been to, uh, you know, like AnthroCon, Midwest Fur Fest, uh, Furry Weekend of Atlanta, and a few other little kind of like random kind of like geek and sci-fi conventions just kind of scattered all over there. They're fun for me to visit, but it's even more fun for me to be behind the scenes, helping helping out, helping run things. To me, it's always about just, just being involved with everybody there. And I honestly get bored if I don't have something to do, and I've never been big on going to panels. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. And, well, that, at least you give some people some insight on what to do. If you want to go to a convention and want to do stuff, you could help out. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a lot of, uh, I, I tell you, it's a lot of inside information you get that you might not be privy to, and um, you get access to certain areas that maybe you wouldn't get to uh, as a regular attendee. Uh, I've had some of these cons I've, I've gone to, I've just been able to sit down and talk to the guests uh, regularly. Like, I don't know how much you know about anime and the voice actors there, but when I was at Sakura Con, I got to just kind of hang out with Vic Manana. Well, that's awesome. And he's a very talented voice actor, too. Yep. Uh, mostly known for Ed from Full Aquas, but he's, he's done lots of stuff. True, true. And that wraps up our show for tonight. So thank you very much for listening to the MBS show this week. I've been Daniel Anthony. And I am Norman Sanzo. And I am Master Clockwork. We will see you again next week. Take care, everybody. See ya. Good night.
So, Norman, how about the next news topic? Um, do you want to ask Clockwork? That's rude of you. He already said what he wanted to say. Really? I didn't hear. I got cut off. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact it. <laughs> Not easy, eh? <laughs> <laughs>